All right, it looks like the number has stopped rising. So good morning, afternoon, and evening all. Thanks for joining us from wherever you are. My name is Luke Sanford, and I'm an assistant professor of environmental policy and governance at the Yale School of the Environment based in New Haven, Connecticut, USA. I'm joined in this series by faculty from the Yale School of the Environment, including Dr. Sarah Kibbing, research scientist and the director of the Yale Applied Science Synthesis Program, Dr. Mark Bradford, professor of soils and ecosystem ecology, and Reed Lewis, PhD candidate at the Yale School of the Environment, with guest instructors, Brad Gentry, professor in the practice of forest resources management and policy and co-director of the Center for Business and the Environment, and Francis Seymour, associate research scientist and distinguished senior fellow at the World Resources Institute. The lecture today is part of a speaker series hosted by the Yale Forest Forum on what makes a high quality forest carbon credit. This series is co-sponsored by the Forest School and the Yale Applied Science Synthesis Program, all based at the School of the Environment. The High Quality Forest Carbon Credit Series is meeting weekly on Tuesdays through early December. This session will be recorded and available on Yale Forest Forum's website. The lecture will run 25 minutes with Q&A to follow. Please remember to submit questions using the Q&A function. This webinar is scheduled to end at 12.10 Eastern Time. If you have any series related questions for us, please email yff at yale.edu. In this seminar series, we've been exploring the current state of carbon markets in the United States and asking major market players, including ecosystem scientists, registry developers, credit producers, forest land owners, corporate buyers, and academics to address the question of what makes a high quality forest carbon credit and provide suggestions on how we can build credibility, quality, and trust in forest carbon credits. So far, we've heard from speakers that gave introductions to the science of forest carbon dynamics, the protocols that underpin forest carbon offset creation, how forest carbon credits are generated in the United States, and a number of critiques against the forest carbon offset market. We've also learned about three different experiences developing carbon projects. Today, we're incredibly fortunate to have Jacqueline Patterson joining us to speak about environmental justice and carbon credits and to provide an equity and justice-based analysis of carbon offsets. Jacqueline is the founder and executive director of the Chisholm Legacy Project, a resource hub for Black frontline climate justice leadership. She's worked on gender justice, racial justice, economic justice, and environmental justice with organizations including the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, IMA World Health, United for a Fair Economy, ActionAid, Health Gap, and the organization she co-founded, Women of Color United. Before founding the Chisholm Legacy Project, Patterson served for 11 years as the Senior Director of Environmental and Climate Justice at the NAACP. She serves on the boards of directors for the Institute of the Black World, the American Society of Adaptation Professionals, National Black Workers Center Project, Bill Anderson Fund, and the advisory boards for the Center for Earth Ethics and the Hive Fund. We're so excited to have you join us today. Welcome and over to you, Jacqueline. Thank you so much. It's so such an honor to be here with you all. Looking forward to having this conversation. And I appreciate you inviting the perspective of environmental justice analysis on, on offsets. For a lot of people, the, there's an assumption that it's just uh, it's just a state of, uh, that that's just the way things are going to be, <laughs> that there will be offsets and there's kind of no question about it. And for environmental justice communities, there's a lot of questions about it and a lot of concerns about it. So I really am appreciative that you invite this, uh, this dialogue. So I want to just kind of start us off uh, with a quick video, which I hope will go well, um, that um, where John Oliver gives his perspective on, on carbon offsets. And so if you all know him, you can imagine that it's uh, slightly comical, but um, but but also I thought uh, a, a very kind of nice and succinct way of, of talking about it. But then I'll, I'll really go deeper into environmental justice analysis. So here we go. Let's find this. Of course, I tried to close all my zillions of windows, but I just reduced them, and it's uh, kind of like a metaphor on the offset situation. So um, so here we go. Um, so, let me know if you can't hear that. Our lucky story tonight concerned Earth. It's basically the Oscar Isaac of planets in that it seems to be getting alarmingly hotter every year. It's pretty clear this planet is not doing great. The level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is now higher than ever in human history. And a recent UN Commission climate report was called an atlas of human suffering, which coincidentally is also the slogan for crazies. Luckily though, 
One group is here to fix it, giant corporations. Many are now claiming that they've hit upon a solution to becoming carbon neutral or net zero, basically running their businesses in such a way that they don't increase the amount of carbon in the atmosphere. As of last year, one in five of the world's 2,000 largest publicly listed companies have now committed to a net zero emissions target, which sounds great. You might even have seen them bragging about their claims in ads like this one from United Airlines, this one from Apple, uh, this one from Shell, and this one from an unexpected source. KitKat is committing to becoming carbon neutral by 2025, reducing emissions by 50% through forest regeneration, planting 5 million shade trees, supporting regenerative farming, and securing 100% renewable electricity for our factories worldwide and will offset any remaining carbon by investing in climate projects. Let's give the planet a break. Yeah, even Kit Kat is getting involved, which is a strange sales technique. It's not like you decide to eat a Kit Kat bar because of their net zero targets. You decide to eat one because you're at rock bottom and you've run out of Reese's peanut butter cups. That's why you do it. Now, as for these shovel made out of a Kit Kat, it's less like a sustainable farming tool than like what you'd use to bury the body of the red m and but the key phrasing comes at the end there, that they offset any remaining carbon. That's actually a common tactic. In fact, one study that looked closely at the net zero promises of dozens of companies in heavily polluting industries found that two thirds of them are relying on offsets instead of emissions reductions. Offsets are wildly popular. Even banks have promised over the years to use them to reduce the environmental impact of their tours. All the greats have done this, Dave Matthews, Bon Jovi, Coldplay, and even Sgt. Pepper's angsty Victorian ghost club band, like Chemical Romance. A big tour like this uses lots of energy, trucks, vans, lights, sound, and more. And that has an impact on the environment. So we've partnered up with a really cool nonprofit organization called Reverb to help us green things up. One of the things that they do is figure out how much energy the tour uses. Then they invest in alternative energy projects to help make up for it. Cool. Skies. I admit it is nice to see them represent their core fan base, middle schoolers who have to give a presentation in front of the class against their will, but I don't particularly care for the phrase green things up there. It's not something Shrek. Okay, so I think you get the idea there. <laughs> he goes on for another 25 minutes, but I didn't want to totally uh, cede my space to John Oliver, <laughs> but I just thought I would, I would start us off on a, on a John Oliver note because he st states things so well. So now, in getting into the environmental justice perspective, which, which actually, interestingly enough, mirrors a, a lot of, uh, of what John Oliver has to say as it relates to the basic premise of, of uh, carbon offsets. So we uh, wrote, to, wrote a paper called The Nuts, Bolts, and Pitfalls of Carbon Pricing when I was at the NAACP, and it, it follows in the footsteps of many of the environmental justice climate justice uh, world. And so we, we really uh, are, are echoing, um, amplifying, and the, 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 uh, the very sentiments, analysis, and experiences of frontline communities in this paper. And so, so just the agenda of the paper, I'll talk a little bit about who, who, who's come before us in terms of, like I said, we are just kind of echoing and amplifying in a lot of ways, give a sense of who the authors are, and then um, go more into the actual uh, results of the, of the analysis. And so we, uh, right now I'm at the um, UN Framework Convention on Climate Change Conference of Parties number 27 in Egypt. And so I'm talking to you live and direct from the first ever climate justice pavilion that is happening here at, at COP27. And so I'm literally in the little back office here. So you might hear some interruptions as people come in and out. But um, but here there are these very people who have uh, who have, who have been the authors of these uh, texts, the carbon pricing primer that Indig Indigenous Environmental Justice in Environmental Network put together, the hoodwinked in the house hot house that was put together by groups like Just Transition Alliance. 
Climate Justice Alliance, Grassroots Global Justice, Indigenous Environmental Network, and others. And so these, these various volumes really are variations on the same theme, which is an, a critique of false solutions, which many consider um, offsets to be, that, that they are something that, well, we'll talk more about that. <laughs> and so I really wanted to make sure that we lift up um, who, who came before us and who we're amplifying in this work. And so myself and um, Kathy Egland, who was the, who is, who is the Environmental Justice Committee Chair for the National Board of Directors for the NAACP. When we wrote it at the time, I was the Senior Director of the Environmental Climate Justice um, Program at the NAACP. But as you know now, I'm now the founder and executive director of the Chisholm Legacy Project. Laura Steichen, who was an intern with us, and then, um, and then, uh, so, Salem, Salim, actually his name is spelled incorrectly there. Um, Salim Chapman, who was a, um, a, a consultant with us. And then also Mandy Lee, who was the director or program manager of our um, Centering Equity and Sustainable Building Sector Initiative. And then also Zoe Lee Park, who is also a volunteer with us. So when we talk about the context, this is the context, as you, as you know, the polluting facilities that are out there, whether it's oil refineries that are pictured here, coal-fired power plants, uh, other manufacturing plants, these are all the landfills and so forth. These are all the kind of major perpetrators of the emissions that drive climate change. And when we talk about the, the historical context of, of an extractive economy, which which again, the environmental justice community considers us as to be yet another tool of the extractive economy, a way to continue to extract, a way to continue to, to pollute and then just pay a little bit to, to, to do so. So when we talk about this history of extraction, it starts with the, the beginnings of this place that we now call the United States, contrary to this kind of uh, narrative around the explorers who have come seeking, you know, seeking adventure, like they're, they're always kind of termed as explorers or adventurers, but we know they came with an extractive um, agenda to extract spices, to extract, um, 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 other types of uh, yeah spices and other types of uh, things from the earth really, and uh, to to grow riches to take back um, and and what and what began was the 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 uh, the the drawing the sorry driving people out of their lands by murder by dis by violence and by displacement and then going forward and getting back on those ships and going over to sub-Saharan Africa and stealing people from their lands from their from their history, from their heritage, from their families, from what would have been their wealth to then become the commoditized wealth of, of families going forward as, as people became enslaved and, um, and then also became the commodities that formed our extractive economy in terms of the first markets. And so we, we have this and then we have the beginning of the extracting from the land at the same time. And then we also have the systematic, systematic systematization as we went forward with trade, manufacturing, finance, and labor policies, including now the policies, the ways that um, carbon offsets have been, are trying to be moved into our, our economy. And so a current course is the commoditization of, of natural resources. And as I said, the beginnings of the of the markets. Um, and again, this is, you know, as you can imagine, if you were actually chattel, if you were actually uh, commodity to be traded on the market, you're not a big fan of the markets. And so as Black folks, we definitely um, um, have this history and this and this, uh, and, the, and the, up until the present day, the, back then it might have been our bodies, our labor that were enslaved and sold on the markets. But today, I thought even our communities that are being um, commoditized and sold and in um, and, and, and similar ways. And so, what, and, and even as people began to, to be a part of the markets, um, they, they uh, is as it became kind of part of the American dream to to have the white picket fence and to be and to be and to be a, a winner in the market because the markets are set up to be there where there's winners and losers and so as people started to move in and, and start to build their own um, economies and start to participate 
then there was a backlash against that. As soon as, as, soon as uh, African-Americans started to, 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 to begin to put together some commodities ourselves, then we had things like the Tulsa race massacres, which was a, a, an uprising against even trying to participate in some small way in the market. So again, it was never for us. Um, it was always about our commoditization in the markets. This is a video I would have shown you, but not quite enough time, but I highly recommend you check it out, Climbing Poetry, um, which is a spoken word duo. But in there, they talk about, um, in the post Sandry post situation, they talk about who is building and who are they building for, who pays and who gets paid. And again, even in the context of disasters, it's all kind of a, you know, a, the disaster recovery recovery and who does well and who is again commoditized it's all kind of part of this market-based economy and extractive economy um, this is the international forum on globalization they um, put together this kind of schematic to talk about the ways that um, folks who win in the market control so much else in our society whether it's the media think tanks congressional members, courtrooms, even academia. Um, I, I famously talked about when I was speaking at a, a meeting and um, I found out that the Koch brothers were one of the um, funders of that university. It was a university, I was doing a talk at a university. And as soon as I stepped up out of, up on stage, there was a citywide blackout. And so we were all kind of joking that they were, we were convinced that it was the Koch brothers who had decided to silence me, but it turned out it was squirrels that somehow got into the grid. But um, anyway, but the Koch brothers are, and, and they're alike, are pretty kind of um, pervasive in their control. And so therefore we have this kind of uh, uh, displacement of democracy. Um, and I can go on and on about the various ways that the markets uh, are, 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 are harming. And so when we talk about this report, the nuts, bolts, and pitfalls of carbon pricing and equity-based um, primer on paying to pollute, you all know the kind of basic, basics of carbon pricing and what how it actually works. So I won't kind of go into that. Um, the, you know, kind of the history of it from the Kyoto Protocol that started to institutionalize to REGI, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiatives, which is also kind of part of this notion of, of kind of cap and trade and, and um, trading these, uh, these permits. And, um, and so I'm not gonna necessarily go into all of that. Um, as we talk about for, uh, forestation, um, y'all have heard of Red Plus, of course, but that's what we're here to talk about. So reducing em em emissions from uh, deforestation and forest degradation. And so again, y'all know it allows credits to be issued, which would quantify the amount of carbon saved through avoided deforestation. deforestation. Um, so we'll, we'll talk more about that. <laughs> but uh, and the, the regional greenhouse gas initiative, similar, even the, the um, SOX uh, allowance trading program, similar in the California capital trade program and so forth. So the challenges that we have with it is one that it is missing the big picture. Um, that, that when people in favor of carbon pricing say that market-based solutions are elegant and efficient, and that when a price is assigned to carbon emissions, polluters will be incentivized to reduce emissions and encouraged to invest in alternative forms of energy. That, that would be in an ideal case scenario, yes, but too often it fails to recognize that it's not a tech problem that can be fixed with just this market-based notion because it's a symptom of this larger um, uh, effective economy issue and that and that um, and so it's it, it's not kind of just something that we can tweak here or tweak there because it's actually systematized this this notion of of this carbon uh, carbon economy um, number two is that carbon pricing schemes are not designed to produce localized emissions reductions. And this is one of the biggest challenges that environmental justice communities have with it. There's another part of the um, of the Stephen of the uh, John Oliver thing that I would have shown you if we had had more time, where it talks about kind of this notion of it might reduce, it might not reduce it, 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 it actually is the pollution is happening in one place, and then someone's paying an offset that will maybe plant trees in some other place and um 
and it's and in some cases it, can, it actually because it's this pay to the pollute system the various communities that are that are most likely to be host to pollution can actually be could actually be host to more pollution because there is not this localized emission reduction. It's just like you, you know, you pollute and you pay, and the money goes someplace else, and you just continue. You can just continue to pollute without actually stopping, as long as you have enough money to pay to offset the the cost of what you're polluting. And so, and it. And given the amount of profits that these companies are often making, for them, there's another video I would have shown you where there's a spoken art word artist where she says, "Give them a fine, it's fine." Like if they're if the the amount of money that they're paying, the level, the amount of price that you would have to have to make a carbon price to actually make a significant enough uh, reduction in in the ability to pollute is so big that it's not even under consideration <laughs> because uh, for these folks it wouldn't even it wouldn't even be worth their time to bend down and pick up a hundred dollar bill if they dropped it <laughs> because they that's that's how much money is in these um is is in the in, in the pockets particularly of the of the energy sector so Again, we we contend that the carbon pricing programs in this way actually are are benefiting polluters because they're they're paying negligible amounts by comparison, and they continue to make billions of dollars in, in profits. Um, that produce significant results. Like we haven't seen, like when you look at the, the analysis of various carbon pricing schemes, we haven't seen kind of at scale a significant reduction in emissions. Um, and again, this the equity language that people are trying to to co-opt in order to advance and justify um, uh, this carbon market is just not um, is just not true because again they're buying their way out of um, stopping pollution. And so the economic justice arguments that say that it helps deliver economic justice, when unfortunately again the the amounts that they're paying is, is tokenistic compared to the fact that with pollution continuing, it's not just like people are coughing a little bit, it's people are dying. So what amount of money is going to compensate for people having to bury their children? Um, what kind of money is going to compensate for people having lifelong chronic illnesses because of the pollution that they're suffering? What kind of money is going to compensate for the place, fact that places like Barbuda in, for the first time after Hurricane Katrina, for the first time in 300 years, didn't have anyone living there because the entire island was displaced because every last structure was decimated by that by that disaster. And these disasters are only getting bigger and worse. Um, we talk about this this notion of um, urgency in terms of um, realistic action. Again, um, people people claim like we just need to do something because yes, it's not going to be the, the the best solution, but we have to do something. And we don't have time to wait for a better solution. It's not a matter of waiting; it's a matter of actually committing to doing what we actually have to do, which is stopping uh, carbon emissions at its source, not just not kind of um, making feasibility arguments when it's the the people and the planet that are losing on a daily basis while we while we try to continue with business as usual and just kind of play a shell game um, with, um, with our solutions. So the arguments that we are making in the, and I'm not sure where we are time-wise. Okay, yeah, I know, because I wanna make sure we have enough time for, for, uh, for um, conversation. So, so some of the audiences we talk about, we start even often uh, with the black community, a community that we're talking to often, we, 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 we uh, include the religious and spiritual argument in terms of the sacredness of life and that we can't put a price tag on what we understand to be sacred. Um, that making the human rights argument, we already talked about the harms of the fossil fuel economy. And we again contend that putting, uh, putting these offsets in place isn't going to be enough to actually curb the, the, the multitudinous um, human rights impacts of a carbon full economy. That again, as we said before, this tinkering with the price of carbon um, doesn't address the root causes of climate change. Um, it just like literally just uh, talks about the symptoms and doesn't even effect effectively address those. And so we need to really be looking at the, the what's at the core of our kind of um, addiction to carbon, which is this extractive economy 
And so, of course, uh, the environmental impact, um, I think for you, you don't have to, to, to know that, to hear that um, from me, because we all know why we have to, to reduce carbon emissions and, uh, and methane emissions and the super pollutant emissions and um, the coal pollutant emissions. Um, and so as we think about the way that we feel like we do have to go instead of, and, and so we don't want to all kind of just be against something without talking about what we're for. So as we talk about moving from an extractive economy to a living economy, we really need solutions that are actually visionary so that we're looking at, at the, the root causes and actually saying what, what kind of transformation is needed to address something that's baked into the very structure of our economy. So these are the people's demands um, from the Climate Justice Alliance and 150 organizations globally um, put together these people's demands for climate justice. Keep fossil fuels in the ground, period. Reject false solutions that are displacing real people first solutions to the climate crisis. Advance real solutions that are just feasible and essential. Honor climate finance obligations to developing countries. This is a lot of what we're talking about here at the UNFCCC COP27. Um, in corporate inter all the things that you Um, we have to get uh, money out of politics and money out of the courtrooms and money out of our regulatory systems. Um, ensuring developed countries honor their fair shares for large for largely fueling this crisis. And that's, again, a lot of what we're talking about here. And when we talk about loss and damage, we're saying that there really needs to be climate reparations for people, for, for communities and countries that are least responsible but most impacted by, by climate change. So it's being advanced by polluters and profiteers. So, as we talk about US policy recommendations, it's everything from restructuring the utility system to move away from a system that is literally this investor owned utility system. So it's, it's, uh, its goal is to make as much money as possible for these investors, as opposed to providing energy for everyone who needs it in an affordable, accessible way. Um, we, um, anyway, long story there. But um, so investing in large scale public works projects that promote energy efficiency and develop community-based clean energy infrastructure, creating pathways for displaced fossil fuel workers to make sure that they're transitioning into the clean energy economy or whatever other aspects of uh, a regenerative economy that they would like to participate in, making sure that we have affordability policies that reduce costs and lower energy burdens again, so that we can we don't we we move away from a system that props up profiteers and polluters and move towards a system that props up people and the planet. So again, these are just kind of getting into a lot of kind of specifics around it, but these are, you know, zero, zero energy homes, moving investments from highway to, for, I mean, moving away from highway and so forth to public transit, ending corporate agricultural consolidations and restoring local food systems, setting targets to completely transition the entire economy away from fossil fuels, etc. So there's, you know, these, you can all see this in the, um, in the pits, pit, pitfalls and uh, of of carbon pricing paper, but just kind of laying them all out so you can see them again. And I can also make sure you all have a copy of this presentation because I do want to get to our, our conversation. But again, rejecting policies built around false solutions, which we consider offsets to be. And, and, and even though we, I'm actually a part of the project, a project called the Ubuntu um, a Climate um, Project that's all about actually planting trees. It's all about forestation and it's all about both um, planting trees as a as a interim strategy as we but the interim strategy is recognizing that pollution is uh, is is going to continue until we build, build build the political will otherwise but we're also simultaneously not having this be a um, a, a a kind of pathway to continue to pollute for, for polluters, but it's a way of protecting communities by having trees both for, for canopy 
um, and, and in terms of as the earth continues to heat because of the continuation of polluters, also having trees for for absorption of the pollution that's that's happening in the in the um, atmosphere, as well as having trees for producing producing the food that we need as we need to as we experiencing shifts in agricultural yields as a result of of climate change and the continued pollution. But we don't do this as as an alternative. We don't do this as a as an alternative to, to stopping pollution as a source because we're still just as aggressively stopping uh, pushing to stop pollution at its source. We need to shift funds away from these billions trillions of dollars in military expenditures and shifts towards produce, protecting planet and people and, and where necessary pursuing legal action against climate offenders. So as opposed to paying a price to pollute, people need to pay a, a penalty for failing, failing to stop polluting is our, um, is our uh, recommendation. So see, so this that ends with our final recommendation, which is considering going beyond regulation to criminalization, because just as much as you know, a, a gun in someone's hand is, is, um, is homicide, putting knowingly putting pollution into the atmosphere that's killing planet and people should be criminalized. Um, um, especially if it's unnecessary. So I know I was talking fast, <laughs> but uh, I just wanted to get through so we have a chance to chat a little bit. But um, if you have any questions or if you want, I mean, I think I'll make sure you all get a copy of the presentation, but if you ever want to follow up for any other reasons, that's the email address to best reach our, our team. And again, you'll get a copy of this, so you don't have to write that down. So I will stop screen sharing and I look forward to a little chat with you all. Amazing. Thank you so much, Jacqueline, for that that really um, enlightening presentation. Uh, we have a few questions coming in from the chat. So the first one that I wanted to, to pose to you, uh, since you are in Egypt, is how does the UN high-level expert group report on net zero commitments, Integrity Matters, help to resolve some of these issues, especially since that uh, since equity and justice is the fifth of their five principles. Do you think it's sufficient or what else needs to be added? Yeah, good question. Um, so, you know, it's a, it, 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 it could sound purist, <laughs> you know, our various kind of perspectives on this as the EJ community and, and it, and it could sound, um, you know, not feasible or not realistic in its purity, <laughs> um, and, so to speak. Um, and really the EJ community, the climate justice community, the people on the front lines here, fairly reject the term net zero <laughs> because, uh, because the net means that there are certain places and it's our communities that are the ones that are continuing to be like, so it's net zero, but it means not just zero. And so, so really from its very title, not to mention the contents, people don't consider it to be enough. It certainly is, you know, trying to, to, commit, to have the right considerations and so forth. And until it's kind of in its totality, eliminating um, advancing a carbon free economy as opposed to a net zero economy, it's not going to be enough for the folks who, again, are the ones who are attending and hosting the, the funerals. And I know it sounds so, you know, so, so devastating and so forth, but it is the reality of the frontline communities. It's just, yeah, it's just tough in that sense. So, so yes, yes, the report kind of you know, <laughs> moves it along from where it was, which is terrible to like less terrible, <laughs> but it's still um, it's still not quite there in terms of ambition, in terms of audacity, in terms of the reality of what we're going to need to to turn things around. So that's kind of where, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Sure. Yeah. Um, a, a little bit different track here, but a question that we have is when you use the term carbon pricing, are you also referring to a carbon tax? And the the question proposer notes that carbon tax would make fossil fuels more expensive, thereby in theory reducing the incentive to use fossil fuels, which seems like the direction that you think we should be going. Yeah, and I definitely, yes. So I definitely hear that. And, and so carbon pricing and carbon taxing is kind of just along that same continuum as a, uh, so a carbon tax puts a price on carbon mechanism is through taxation. And so the issue there is how much of a tax would it take to make it actually 
reduce emissions versus, I mean, when we're talking about these profits being in the billions and billions of dollars, and when we talk about uh, the, the corporatocracy in which we exist, where so many of the, like they'll, they find ways to get around policies, they find ways to increase profits in another place, they find ways to, especially with something as essential as energy, um, they find ways. <laughs> and so for us, um, even making it more expensive can in some ways actually increase pollution in certain places because if, you, if it's more expensive to, to, do, to create energy or in, in general, then it means that, okay, the places that were peaker plants before that they only did it during certain times that tend to be in our communities, they're gonna run those plants all the time. And so it's more pollution in the places where it's cheaper for them to operate and it's cheaper for them to operate in our communities. And so that's where you see where even it, even increasing the, the amount of money it takes to pollute and to, it actually can have, uh, it can create hot spots and make it worse for certain communities. I was on a, on a, on a uh, working group where we were back when the climate action plan that President Obama was putting out and someone said, well, I think we can all agree that emissions reduction in the aggregate is, is a good thing. And we're like, no, actually not because emissions reduction in the aggregate could actually mean emissions increases in our community. So that's where the challenge comes in there. Great. And I think we have time for maybe one more question, maybe two, depending on how long it takes you. So I think I'm going to pose be, this one, which is, <laughs> yeah. well, um, no, this is a good one, I think, which is, um, do you reject all aspects of the carbon market since you assert that it violates the tenets of the of DEIJ needs? And maybe mm -hmm. to blend in a second question is, is there any distinction in your mind between voluntary offset markets and compliance markets where voluntary offset markets might not, or voluntary credit markets might not be used to offset emissions? Yeah, thank you. That's an important distinction. Um, pretty much the environmental justice and climate justice communities kind of aren't in favor of any of it. And kind of for the very reasons I stated before in terms of, um, in terms of it just that that it actually no matter how people are offsetting that you know if you're if you're if you're and I and I will make sure you all get the link to the John Oliver thing because there's actually a couple of places later where he explains it very well. But if you're offsetting in one place, it might not actually affect the other place. What where is it? It's the communities that are bearing the the, the pollution. It's the communities that are very bearing the impacts. And you're offsetting here, and those communities would never, may never see those improvements in emissions or those improvements in, you know, the ability to 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 recover or build resilience to the impacts of climate change. And so this is where where those challenges really come in in terms of even how we do it. It's just all kind of nuanced, but not a, but none of it is enough. For for the for the communities, but one thing I will say too is in that in that same report, the nuts, bolts, and pitfalls of carbon pricing, there is a place where we're saying, okay, if it is going to go forward, here are the principles and practices that we need to integrate to make it at least mitigated in terms of its impacts. Thanks. I think that's actually a really great answer to end on, and we've just hit our time as well. So uh, please join me in saying thank you so much to Jacqueline Patterson for joining us today. Um, Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so, so much. So please note that the lecture recordings will be available on the Yale Forest Forum website. Uh, please continue to join us for more in this series on Thursdays from 11.30 to 12.10 Eastern Time this fall. Next week, uh, we'll be joined by Tom Hodgman, who's the Vice President of Nature-Based Solutions at Goldman Sachs to speak about climate investing. If you'd like to receive a continuing education certificate of attendance for today's lecture, please stay on for a few minutes and take down the instructions on the next slide. Thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you next week.